but they will deny his lordship. Men shall do their own thing instead of the Lord's thing. And in verse 2 it says, Many shall follow their pernicious ways. By reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken. And verse 3 says, Through covetousness they shall with vain words make merchandise of you. In other words, they will say words that are invented to deceive you. And the motive for this will be covetousness. Now every person who has a human nature is subject to covetousness. And if there is covetousness in this, in this uh, uh, spiritual revival that we're looking at, just suppose that I am a great preacher. And I am covetous. And I know that you have in your possession some money that I would like to get. How will I get it? I will appeal to your covetousness. I will tell you that if you give what you have to my ministry, God will give you much more. First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Not his wealth, his righteousness. You say all along, people say all along, and then the promise is all these other things shall be added unto you. But he does not say, seek all of these other things. He has told us to seek him. And if we will seek him, he has promised us our food and our raiment. In every in other words, everything we need, not everything we want. So today, because we have been taught by many, many preachers that if we will give, we will get. So what we must be looking at is the motive with which we do things. So whenever the man is the man, the man of Israel who were godly men. Moses, Moses, Moses gave up the riches of Egypt to follow God. Many of these men of the Old Testament suffered greatly to follow God. All of the godly prophets of Israel suffered even to death to preach the gospel. And then Papa, so we recognize that God never promised 
to make the Christians comfortable or rich. So, in fact, in, in uh, 2 Timothy, chapter 4, and I noticed that this verse is on your wall right there. So, this is important, saints. And all of us are preachers of the gospel. Now listen to what it says will happen in the last day. Now listen to what it says will happen in the last day. Okay, this is 2 Timothy 4, 2 through 4. He said, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and suffering. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heed to themselves teachers because they have itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned on the table. Many, many men today are presenting things from the Bible but not in the context of the Bible. He says they will have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof from such turn away. Now, if we are going to be victorious, especially in this last day, we must see God's way of appropriating the life of Christ. God's word teaches us very clearly the simple path to godliness. Okay, now here's a question. Where are we in history? How many of you believe that Jesus is coming again? Amen. Amen. Then that's what you're waiting for. Now, the wonderful things that God has promised us are they for now or for when Jesus comes? No, for now, God has promised us all that we need. But when Jesus comes, we will have a new body. There will be no more sin. We will be ruling and reigning with Jesus. And very often the promises that are for them are presented to us as though they are for now. Now, if I had everything, if I had wealth and uh, good transportation and wonderful health and I was very happy, would that be a real testimony of Jesus? 
And it seems like the whole span of time, from the beginning of time till the end of time, was a week. Not, not a week of days. Or a week of years. Or even a week of centuries. But a week of millennia. It's as though from, from creation to Abraham was approximately 2,000 years. So it was two days from Adam to Abraham. And then it was two days from Abraham to Christ. And in Hosea there is a prophecy that the Lord Jesus would go away and he would be gone for two days and he would come back and he would rule over Israel on the third day. So it's two days from Christ when he went away till when he comes back again. And then when he comes back again, there will be the seventh day, which is the time when Jesus rules upon the earth for a thousand years. So where are we now? How long has Jesus been gone back to his father? It will soon be 2,000 years. So as we look for the time when Jesus will come again, we realize, oh, it's almost now. So God has not taught us to look for prosperity and have our minds set on earthly things now. And not on the things on the earth. If I serve Jesus for what I can gain on the earth, I have my reward already. But God is laying up our reward in heaven, and when Jesus comes, we'll all give account to him, and he will reward us according to our faithfulness. There are many great preachers who are who have gained much and they say this is my reward from God. And I would say to those preachers, you can have that reward if you want it, but my reward is in heaven. I will not trade my heavenly reward for any earthly thing. And don't you do that either. Many of these preachers are 
great men we think of as being men of God, great people. But God doesn't think that way. God has taught you how to live. If you are a housewife, God has told you exactly how to live. If you are a husband, God has told you exactly how to treat your wife. If you are a worker, God has told you exactly how to be a faithful worker. And God has all given us all the same gospel to pass on to others. And when we stand before Jesus when he comes in just a few more years or months, uh, and when Jesus comes in just a few more years or months, he will call us into account. And the great preachers will come and say, here I am, I've come to receive my reward. And Jesus will say, oh, oh, you've already received your reward. You have no reward. And then the dear housewife will come and she has done nothing except faithfully follow the word of God. And God will say, well done, thou good Your reward is great because you did what I told you to do. And he'll come to the faithful worker who has been abused by his employer but still remain faithful. And he'll say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, hast thou ruled over many cities. And God is calling us to be faithful. And some of us get tired because it seems like it's been so long. Jesus keeps saying he's coming, but he's not here yet. Saints, he's almost here. He's almost here. He's coming. So be faithful. Now, many believers want to enter into the life of Christ. They want to live for Christ. And sometimes we try and we fail. Has anyone here ever failed? Just me? We fail many times, we feel unworthy. And sometimes the reason we fail is because we're trying to live like Jesus. We're trying to bear about in our body the life of Christ. I want you to turn over to Romans. Now the Lord really impressed me with this one day. 
He impressed me with this when I was struggling and feeling like I was not living as victoriously as I should. And this is the sixth chapter of Romans. And reading down through verse 7. Okay, verse 1. What? Okay. Okay. what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Now listen, saints, to what Paul is saying to us here. He says the reason we don't live in sin is because we're dead to sin. Well, that's puzzling, isn't it? Now listen to verse 3. Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? We were not baptized into his life, we were baptized into his death. Now think of this, when, when uh, a sinner tries his best to live like Jesus or to manifest the life of Jesus, he fails. Uh, because anything that comes from that sinner, that originates in that sinner, no matter what he's trying to do, is sin. The only thing, the only thing you and I can produce from our own self is sin. I'll give you an example. When Israel came to the Red Sea, God opened the Red Sea. And by faith, the Israelites walked through the sea on dry land. And then it says, the Egyptians trying to walk through the Red Sea were drowned. But the, the, the Israelites walked by faith in God through the Red Sea. The Egyptians, without faith in God, tried to walk through the sea. For the Israelites, it was life and safety. For the Egyptians, it was death and drowning. So you can't be righteous by trying to imitate Jesus. Uh, oh, 
Now listen to verse 4. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into life. We are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Four, verse five. If we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. We are not trying to live the life of Christ. We are by faith entering into the death of Jesus Christ. Tell me how many mistakes a dead man can make. Uh, Tell me how many victories a dead man can have. It's the life of Christ that gives us victory. Verse 5. As I come. If we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. And here's something we know. Verse 6. Now before I read verse 6, I want to tell you that I read this verse many times before I understood it. I was a missionary in Korea for many years. And I taught the word. And I taught from Romans 6. And I would read verse 6, which says this. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. In order that the body of sin might be destroyed. That henceforth or from now on you should not serve sin. Yeah, I'm not sin as a mom. And I would read that verse and then I would say something like this. You see, we need to be crucified with Christ. Is that what the verse says? It doesn't say that. It says, knowing this, that we are crucified with Christ. Well, I either believe it or I don't believe it. When I say I need to be crucified with Christ, that means I'm not crucified with Christ. I was like the Egyptians going to the Red Sea. I was trying to be crucified with Christ. 
And then one morning when I was sitting, uh, early in the morning I was sitting reading my Bible. And I was reading Romans 6. And I read that knowing this, that we are crucified with Christ. And the light turned on. I suddenly saw it. I don't need to be crucified with Christ. I am crucified with Christ. I don't have to struggle anymore. I have to rest in Christ. It says, when I saw what Christ had done, he had already crucified me, all of a sudden I have entered into a whole new relationship with God. Here's why. If I, if I am really crucified with Christ, a dead man doesn't need anything. So if I lack the things that other people have, doesn't matter. I am crucified with Christ. If I have not reached my ambitions, doesn't matter. I am crucified with Christ. Can you insult a dead man? And I realized if people insult me, I'm crucified with God. That way, I'm I am dead. I need nothing. I cannot be offended. I cannot fail. I cannot succeed. It doesn't matter. I am dead. And listen to the next word. I want to find out this. If I am crucified with Christ, he that is dead is freed from sin. Okay, now I want you to turn over to 2 Corinthians. Okay, this is 2 Corinthians and Paul is writing this. Uh, and uh, I'm looking at verse 8 through 12. Okay. Okay. Well, you... well, it, it, verse 8 through 12. Second Corinthians. Second Chapter 1. Chapter 1. Chapter 1. Okay. Okay. Now, sometimes we think of the Apostle Paul as the great man that we would like to emulate. But in verse 8, I want you to recognize what Paul was enduring. We would not, brethren, have you ignorant of the trouble that came to us in Asia. Uh, 
trouble, Paul, that we were pressed out of measure above strength, in so much we despaired even of life. Oh, Paul, how did you handle that? Oh, Paul, how did you handle that? Oh, Paul, how did you handle that? Verse 9. And they we have to see that we have to we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves but in God which raiseth the dead. So how did you handle it, Paul? We just recognized that we were dead already. It didn't matter. God who raises the dead will raise you up out of these problems in his own time. Now, if we don't have that attitude, saints, then we shall be very miserable in our circumstances. And then we will begin to covet what other people have. And then we will become victims of other men's covetousness. Now I want to read to you from verse 10. It talks about Christ who raised us from the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver us, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. And it's your tiba, I put in you put your to be to bed. Your siba, and your back and one the way, your siba, 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 siba. So looking back, we realize that God delivered us from our trial. Ah, tiba, tiba, where you are, and if we are not tiba, we put your to be. But today we have another trial. But God will deliver us. And tomorrow we will have another trial. But we know that God will yet deliver us. Trouble is not our problem, saints. Even death is not our problem. God from the dead. No, I realize this. Okay, Even while I'm saying these things. Uh, trials personally, trials nationally, trials in every way. But I'm here to testify of this. Although I have no great trial today, in the past I have had many trials that were very hard, and I think in the future I will have more. I know that. What is true of God in every past trial will always be true of God. Now I want you to look at verse 12. Okay. We have trials, but where is our rejoicing? What do we rejoice in? 
Well, this is what the Apostle Paul said, who had more troubles than any of us are passing through right now. Ah. Uh, Paul, Apostle, you this is what Paul said, we have more troubles than any of us have right now. Uh, uh, and then you do we to Our rejoicing is this. The testimony of our conscience. That in simplicity and godly sincerity without fleshly wisdom. But by the grace of God we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you. Lest I weary you from talking too long, uh, I promise you that I will end. I will end my speech. Not right now, but I will end. I pray, my moral, may what see that I'm doing. I don't want you to become weary listening to me. But I want to turn to one more passage of scripture. And I'm going to speak about this for a few minutes before I am. This is also in 2 Corinthians. Chapter 4, verse 5 through 12. Okay, I'm going to read straight through this portion. And then I want to make some comments. Okay, so Paul says, for we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. And our servants, ourselves, your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessel. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side. Yet not distressed. We are, we are perplexed. We're persecuted but not forsaken. We're cast down but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death. For Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be taken. So then death worketh in us some life in you. Now listen, saints. Here is our victory. And here is our testimony. 
When you live in circumstances that would make other people cry, and you are still smiling because of Jesus, that's a testimony. The Lord says, we have this power in earthen vessel. So, so that the power will be of God and not of us. On the outside, you are just an earthen vessel. We're not trying to you the earthen vessel. And Christ in you is your hope of glory. Christ is the treasure within. Do you remember Gideon's army? Do you remember that story? Gideon I uh, had 300 men. And he was trying to defeat an army of a million men. So here was his strategy. We will take an earthen vessel, each one of us, and we will put inside of the earthen vessel a torch, a light. And then at night we will surround this great army of the enemy. Sound, we will smash the earthen vessel and the light will suddenly shine up. So that great army of the enemy thought, oh, we're surrounded by many armies. And they fled. Now, the victory was when we smashed the earthen vessel. He said, you know the your body, then we got the one who will have a day, the one who will have a day. Now, that means that when we die, when we break, when we surrender, the life of Jesus sign shines up. Ah, yes, my now he says that we are trouble on every side. Okay, saints, that was normal for Paul, it's normal for us. Ah, yeah. So external trouble, normal. We are troubled every side, but not distressed. Ah, ah, That's the inside. We we're troubled. We got as much trouble as everybody else, but we're not distressed. Ah, uh, uh, oh, 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 o